Knowledge for Men, Episode 4. Welcome to KnowledgeForMen.com, interviewing the most successful and inspiring people to give you real-world advice to rise above the odds, live a life of purpose, reach your full potential, and become the man you were born to be. And now, your host, Andrew Farabee. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Wayne Levine. He's the director of BetterManCoaching.com, where he coaches men to be the best men, fathers, husbands, and leaders they can be. He is the author of best-selling book, Hold On To Your Nuts, The Relationship Manual for Men. He also conducts live seminars, coaching, retreats for the men in Los Angeles area. Wayne, I'm happy to have you on the show. Well, thank you, sir. Happy to be here. And Wayne, if you can go ahead and kickstart the show with a favorite success quote that you've lived by. (laughs) <laughs> well, the first thing that comes to mind is what Billy Joel always said at the end of his concerts. He would say, don't take any shit from anyone. And it, it has a whole different meaning nowadays for me than it did when I was a young guy. But it's about knowing who you are and uh, knowing what you stand for and not being uh, swayed by uh, forces outside of you that often have their own agendas. And that's such a powerful quote. I mean, one of the biggest things that has helped me succeed in life is just by not caring about what other people think and just doing the things that I want to do. Now, Wayne, can you share with the audience your story? Share the audience your personal journey of what you do. Well, I help men to be the best men, fathers, husbands, and leaders they can be. And, you know, I learned how to be a man late in life. It wasn't until I was about 33 that I got introduced to the circle of men, did a men's weekend. And from there, it really launched me to taking a look at myself and figuring out what it meant for me to be a good man and for me to actually be a man. Because up until that point, I had not really thought of myself that way. I just thought of myself as my mother's baby boy. And it took being in the circle of men to start examining things that I might have normally done had I had a father growing up. Uh, But my dad died when I was nine. I was brought up by a single mom, like a lot of men out there. And uh, so I had some work to do when I became an adult. I'm so sorry to hear that, Wayne. Um, You know, you bring up a really good point. There's so many guys out there who don't have that strong male masculine role model growing up. There's something lacking and you can see it in a lot of guys. So is this what started Better Man Coaching? Is this why you created this program to help those guys in need? Well, it all began when I, I had a, an, an employee, I had a, a business before I was doing this. And he said, hey, do you want to come to an open house of my men's team? And I knew that he was doing something with men. I had no idea what it was. So I went there. And what I saw there that night, and I mentioned this in my book, I describe it a little bit. What I saw, 40, 50 guys playing war ball, you know, dodgeball inside a room with three balls. It was crazy. It was stupid. It was so much fun. And then after that, they started talking about things that were going on. And the way they were talking and the honesty and openness was something I had never experienced before with a group of men. So there was a a men's weekend associated with this group. And they said, hey, there's an opening two weeks from from now. Do you want to go? And they said, if you want to go, just stand up, grab your balls and say, fuck it. So I grabbed my balls and I said, fuck it. And I was driving home that night thinking, "Uh uh-oh, this was the first time that I had made a decision about where I was going to go away for the weekend by myself without even consulting my wife. And I thought, okay, well, it's begun. And she was completely supportive. It really wasn't about her. It was about me growing up. And that's how I got started. So I did my retreat. I was involved as a volunteer in this organization for a couple of years and was in leadership And I found that I had a real affinity for the work. Um, But there were lots of bumps along the way and painful moments. But from there, I went back and got my master's in clinical psychology. And my intention was to uh, become a marriage family therapist. And instead of becoming a licensed therapist, I decided to do my own thing and not be constricted by the rules of the state of California in terms of how I handled men. Because what I do is very different from therapy. So I didn't want the government in my room telling me how to conduct business. 
and the world is a better place because you did, Wayne. So thank you for that. And and I think what you did, uh, that experience you had uh, in your 30s when you first went to that program, that had a huge effect on you. That had a huge change, transformation on the way you look at the world by just being surrounded by the men and by the way that they spoke to each other. There's so much to be learned there. Uh, by being in a circle of men or a mastermind. You said you ran into some bumps. Can you talk about some of those challenges that you faced and encountered? Well, the biggest traumatic event in my life was my dad dying when I was nine. Now, at the time, my mother didn't grieve, and she was my example, and we just sort of moved on. And back in those days, you know, I'm 52 now, Back in those days, we weren't just sent to therapy. It wasn't sort of what was done. So we just moved on. And I just sucked it up and didn't think much of it. And people would say, oh, I'm sorry to hear about what happened to your dad. And I would say, oh, it's okay. And really put it behind me. So I thought. Uh, In high school, um, I had a couple of um, depressive episodes. Things just overwhelmed me. Even when things were going good, I, I became very overwhelmed. I didn't have those connections with men. I didn't have a dad guiding me. And so I just did the best I could on my own. But really, I was flailing. I was successful. I was big man on campus and good grade. I did all that stuff. But inside, I was really hurting. I had another episode like that in college. And I had another episode when my uh, daughter was one year at about her one-year birthday. So there were things working in me. So I ended up going to therapy and starting to find out a little bit about me. But the real change came when I was introduced to the men. And when I was with these guys, meeting with them weekly and doing other things quarterly basis with a bigger group of men, I saw things. I learned what other men were going through. I learned how similar I was, how my story was similar to their story. And that's when I really started to see what a hole there was in my life not having had a dad. And the bumps along the way within this organization were just you know, things that brought me to my knees in terms of being humble, understanding my own arrogance, understanding all the coping mechanisms that I had developed that worked for me when I was little, but were really keeping me separate from men now and affecting all of my relationships. Yeah, that must have been so powerful to be surrounded by a circle of men and to discover that they have similar challenges, similar problems, and they come from similar backgrounds as you do. And, you know, it really helps you think that you're not alone. Everybody else is kind of going through the same thing. And to really open up and talk about that is just so powerful. Now, why was this group of men better than therapy? Well, um, I don't know if it, would, it drove me to be more successful in the classical sense, but it drove me to understand myself better. And that was clearly a path that I was on. I mean, I needed to find that out. And being with the man just showed me how important it was, and what a big part of my life was missing, not having had men in my life. So I learned a great deal of what I teach now from this original experience, and that is in order to be the best man you could be, you have to be in the company of other men. Now, a lot of guys feel more comfortable around women. We live in a very feminized culture, meaning Many boys are grown up to see the world through their mother's eyes because most boys are parented primarily by their mothers. And unfortunately, a lot of guys do not have enough of that masculine influence growing up to have a balanced view and to really have a good, comfortable sense of themselves as men. So they may not be thinking about it yet. And and a lot of the guys in your audience are fairly young and they have more girlfriends than they have guy friends. What makes it uncomfortable for you being with men? And some guys will talk about, well, guys don't reveal themselves. um, They don't open up. But the truth is all men of all ages have great depth in terms of how they feel and what's going on. It's just not socially acceptable for them to share it, except if they're complaining about their women over a beer in a pub or something like that. What you find out for those young guys who are on this path and really have a a sense of wanting more connection with men, you find that all men want to be able to open up. They all want that connection. They all want that support and the wisdom that comes from other men. It's just that many of them don't know it exists. Those who wish they could have it have no idea where to find it. And uh, they're too embarrassed to ask for it. And so they stay isolated without 
that wisdom, without that support, and many you know men become depressed, and the suicide rate is high, and uh, substance abuse is high. So there's a lot of fallout from men being isolated and not connecting. And I think the cure for a lot of our ills begins with us being in the company of other men. Absolutely, Wayne. It's so powerful to be in the company of other men, to share goals, be vulnerable, and for other men to hold you accountable, to share your life's challenges and problems, and to get direct feedback from other people who have been through those similar challenges. And at Knowledge for Men, we actually have our own mastermind group called The Lion's Den. You can learn more at knowledgeformen.com slash lion's den. It's where we set goals, we hold each other accountable, and we really try and become the best man we can be in the areas of health, wealth, relationships, and personal growth. And moving on, Wayne, you talked a little bit about the inner boy that's inside of all men. How can guys get rid of that? So one of, in my book, there are eight tools. And the first tool is silence the little boy. And when guys come to me after reading the book, because, you know, I, I coach them individually and in, in groups and all that. They say that the most painful part of the book was that chapter because they could feel themselves in it. They could, they recognized how that little boy in them is acting out with the women in their lives, how it's undermining those long-term intimate relationships, how it's undermining their ability to father properly how it's undermining their ability to be a mature, grown child and take care of their aging parents. The little boy is that guy who expects her to read your mind, who wants what he wants when he wants it, and if he doesn't get it, he's going to stomp his feet through life one way or another. And that just doesn't work. That doesn't bring men closer to you. That doesn't make women want to stay with you. And to silence the little boy, you have to act in every opportunity more and more like the man you want to be. And that's why it's so important to have these relationships with men and have this masculine energy because you can see in other men how you'd like to behave. Now, you, you'll also see maybe some things, some traits you don't like. But when, you're, when you have enough men in your life, there's almost always an example of the man you want to be in a particular situation. And so you silence that little boy by making a decision in every one of those moments. Now, my reaction is, my knee-jerk reaction might be this, but the man that I want to be in this moment is going to handle it this way. And the more you do that, the more um, you become that man and the quieter that little boy's voice becomes in you. Now, Wayne, should you completely get rid of the little boy or should you let it come out at certain times? This is something that you just get rid of completely. Well, so what you're asking sort of implies this notion that in order for men to have fun, it's, it's, they have to act like little boys, right? But the truth is men can get together and act stupid and do things that women would never do and do things that women should not even know about and, and have an incredible time, right? Uh, this is what men can do. It's not a little boy thing. Unfortunately, most men, when they grow up, they stop doing these things. And it's a shame and it's a loss. And it, it contributes to sort of the feelings that men have of sort of, you know, life is over. I can't do that anymore. I can't do this anymore. Now that I'm married, all of this is gone. And so we experience one loss after another. And the truth is, I'm 52 now. I don't take as many physical chances as I used to when I'm with the guys, but we act stupid and we laugh until it hurts. And, you know, when you have those kinds of relationships with men where they know everything about you, you trust them with every secret you have. Those are the guys that you have that you can have an incredibly fun time with. And it may be doing things like you did when you were a boy. I mean, literally, we have 15, 60-year-old guys playing tag and like gasping for air and laughing hysterically. And it's fabulous, right? The little boy that I'm talking about in the book is, is that wounded little guy that needs to grow up. So, Wayne, what do you think the problem is here? What's going on? Um, but we really don't have rituals in our culture anymore that teaches, that takes boys from boyhood to manhood. Indigenous cultures around the world, some still exist, and they have those rituals where boys are 
you know, they're taken in the middle of the night from their mother's hut. They're taken into the woods or the bush or, where, or the jungle, wherever they are, and they have to go through a, a, an initiatory ceremony. And sometimes it can be weeks or months long, and these boys learn the ways of being a man in their communities. And maybe they have to get tattooed, they get a new name, um, they have to survive. And when they go back to their homes, they know that the little boy now is dead. He's gone. That boy's name is gone. You are now a man. This is what's expected of you in your home and in your community. I mean, that's, that sounds like serious stuff. And we, are, we don't have any of that going on now. You know, there are, there are rituals in church and in temples and bar mitzvahs and things, but they're just parties now because the men, the fathers of the, the bar mitzvahs are, are boys themselves. So they're not even really in a position to teach their sons to be men because they haven't quite learned how to do that themselves. So we've got, we've got an issue going on in our culture where boys just get bigger and they remain boys, as you mentioned, in their, their 20s and 30s and 40s, uh, because we're not paying attention to what young boys need. That's so true. It's so loosely defined in our society of when a boy turns into a man. And, you know, it leaves some guys to have to figure it out on themselves. And they might signify that with losing their virginity or moving away to college for the first time or getting a job or buying their first house. It's very loosely defined in our society of how a boy turns into a man. That's right. Now, some the guys who go into the armed services have an experience that's transformative and unfortunately horrific for a lot of those guys. But that's definitely a rite of passage. I mean, they... They grow up in that. Unfortunately, they're also oftentimes terribly wounded. And so that's a whole other problem that we have in our culture. All the guys coming back from the wars that uh, are hurting and we don't have enough support for them. The, you mentioned that sometimes losing your virginity is it's definitely a milestone, but it doesn't make you a man. In fact, it can set a lot of guys off down a very treacherous path. The habits that we have as men that don't work for us that get us into trouble, that keep us from having healthy relationships, are often forged in middle school and high school. And so oftentimes, as soon as guys get the scent of pussy, that's all they think about. And they sell out themselves and the guys in their lives to be with girls. And you, when you graduate from high school, you go to college, I mean, they just do more of it. And now there's a lot more alcohol and uh, a lot more potential for harm. And then oftentimes you meet a woman and you get married, and now, now you're married, but you are still behaving the same way you did when you were in high school. You don't know anything more. And it seems like it, it's fine, but what happens is the honeymoon is over, and now you're in a relationship you don't like. You don't like yourself. You blame her, and you got a big problem. And if you have kids, now you got a bigger problem. And that's really where men are finding themselves when they're 30, 40, 50 years old. They're they have no idea how they got where they are. Um, they're burdened with so many responsibilities, and they're very unhappy. And the work that we're trying to do here, and a lot of men across the country, around the globe, what they're trying to do is to figure out how do we help men early on so they learn the lessons, get the tools, so they really can be happy in their relationships. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a very difficult, um, it's, a, it's a big issue, and it's very difficult because it's what makes men unhappy in relationships is a very complicated topic. And quite frankly, it's a topic that most people do not even want to address. And I'll tell you that the rates of divorce are very high, 60% maybe more, of you know marriages don't last. And of those remaining marriages, I would tend to say just from what I see in my work, most of those marriages are not very happy. So you have a, a lot of very unhappy men. I think uh, that's a topic we should definitely touch on. What is preventing guys from being successful in their relationships? And what can they do? What steps can they take to make them better? Um, there's a sense that we're meant to be monogamous. We have been taught that that is our natural state of being. And that's what ancient man was. And there's a lot of evidence now um, suggesting that that's completely inaccurate. And there's biological evidence to suggest that certainly cultural. The question is, if marriage were our natural state, why do our religious institutions and our states have to work so hard to try to protect marriage? 
So something's not right. Something's not working. So what I'm driving at partially is that sex is a big problem. There's a buddy of mine who's going to be married soon. And he says, so wait a second. This is the last woman I'm supposed to sleep with for the rest of my life? He said, that's ridiculous. Now, that kind of talk is not socially acceptable. But it is the kind of thought that most men have. Now, some men don't have it. Some young guys don't have that when they are in a relationship early on and they get married. But I guarantee you, down the line, you are going to be wrestling with, how do I deal with the fact that I want to jump on almost everything I see? How do I deal with it? What's a healthy way of dealing with my sexual energy? How do I have the conversation with my wife to have an exciting sex life after it gets stale after a couple of years or after the kids are born. How do I do this? And we are so boxed in, in terms of what is acceptable, that we're not even having the discussions about what men really need, what's natural, and how do we make that happen? And how do you make that happen in your relationship? Churches aren't helping. Temples aren't helping. Our government is certainly not helping. I mean, look look how hard we have to fight just to allow, you know, gay, lesbian, transgender, have a life and have respect. I mean, it's just, it's really horrid what's happening, right? The good news is we're making some progress. The bad news is the forces of evil are great and it takes a, a lot of energy. So this whole issue about sex and monogamy and men is not even being discussed now. But look what's happening. Look at the huge porn industry. That is being fueled by millions and millions of men who are sexually frustrated. Um, hookers in every city getting a lot of money for something that should not, even be, should not even have to be paid for. And so what at one point might have been very natural and free and shared among people in a tribe is now twisted and contorted and now men have to pay for it. And so it's lacking all intimacy. It's really lacking what men really want, but it's the closest thing that, that they can get. And so they try to fill that with this sort of bought feminine energy, and it never, usually never satisfies. As you can see, this is a, it's a charged subject, one that requires a lot of attention. But at least I think I'll do my little part today just to encourage young men to think about this for themselves. Having said all that, I've been married 30 years in December. So I'm happily married, but being happily married did not come easily. Okay, so all the things that I just discussed, all the issues that we talk about with the men, I have experienced almost all of them. All those frustrations, trying to grow up, trying to be a man with my wife, the changes that we go through, how to talk about them, how to steer our sex life in the way that I want, I mean, how to deal with all the changes that happen for both men and women. It's not easy. But I tell you that the, way, the, the reason I've been successful in my marriage is because for the last 20 years, I've had several men always to talk to about every moment when I was pissed, when I wanted to kill her, when I was unhappy. I had men to talk to who were able to ground me get me to look at things more clearly and help to get me out of the problem and into a solution so that I could move forward. Without those guys, man, I have no idea where I'd be right now. So being in the company of men, being surrounded by this circle of men has been invaluable towards your growth. Indispensable for my growth, uh, for the kind of father I've, I've become. I have two grown kids, you know, out of college, out of, you know, out of the house, out of college. And um, I owe everything to those wise men who've been in my circle. And in Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill's most popular book, he says, always seek counsel of other men versus taking action on your own opinion. Always seek counsel of other men. Well, and usually guys are just too proud. They, you know, they've got the mask on. They think they need to do it alone, figure it out alone. Asking for help is weak, and uh, asking for help is courage. It's strength, and anything, anything else is bullshit. I can't tell you how many guys have come to me for help after they made the stupid decision. You know, now they're trying to clean something up, and sometimes the mess is really tremendous. And the older you get and the more responsible you get, those poor choices can have devastating consequences for you, for your woman, for the kids, and 
your business, everything. So asking for help ahead of time. And see, there, there are so many things that make it difficult for us to ask for help. And those issues around our relationships with our father, our relationships with our mother, I mean, how we coped with what happened when we were younger are completely at play. And you may not be aware of it, but all that stuff is going on. And that's what's keeping you from being really clear about what you're committed to and easily distracted with your ego. So you don't want to ask because it'll be too difficult. You don't want to ask for help because it might show that you don't know. You, don't, you may not want to ask for help because you have an authority issue and you'd rather just flip everybody off than, than let them see that you don't know something. I mean, all of that stuff is really weakness. And if you're 20 or 30 and you, you figure out how to overcome all that, you are way ahead of the game. And you bring up a really important point. It's the male ego. Is this a lingering part of the little boy that's still inside? Yes. When you're a mature man, you know the difference between ego and commitment. Now, you asked before, can you ever completely get rid of the little boy? Well, you may never completely get rid of that little boy in you, but you definitely can keep him from determining how you behave. So even now, I've been working on some things for a long, long time. I still have reactions right inside but i don't act on them anymore usually right i don't act out for instance so i'm taking a class now and most a lot of the people in the class are retired you know they're adult education so i'm doing this class uh, a language a new language and i'm sitting next to a guy who sat down after me he was being asked to complete a sentence on the board and because it's a language i'm like sort of whispering out loud i'm pronouncing it i'm trying to get it in my head i'm trying to get clear right he said it really loud he said hey you know you're bothering me i i can't concentrate i'm trying to answer but you're whispering i can't really embarrassing right? So in that moment, he pulled me into this embarrassing moment. Now, I'm not one to get easily embarrassed, but there I was. Now, what I wanted to do was uh, headbutt him and end this stupidity. That's what I felt inside, right? Because he pulled me into the situation. Now, I'm going to eviscerate this guy. Boy, rage. I mean, I felt it. And I said, hey, don't worry about it, dude. He goes, well, I am worrying about it. I mean, he would not let this go. I said... I took a deep breath. I said, I think I'll move. So I picked up my stuff and I moved to another table. And everyone saw it. That kind of energy can really pull you in. And then all of a sudden, you're the idiot. Even though you didn't start it, if you allow those little boy tendencies to get the best of you, now you're the one who's in front of the judge. You're the one who's talking to the cop, even though you didn't begin it, right? So it happens all the time in bars everywhere, in ballparks. Guys are sucked into these interactions because their little boy gets the best of them. And oftentimes it's fueled by alcohol and drugs, which doesn't help the, you know, the, the situation. But so I'm just letting you know that I still have those reactions. Every guy I know has those reactions. The question is, can you be the grown up and not let that drive you? Even telling you about it, I still want to go back and get I this guy. Feel it. I, I feel it. <laughs> I feel your energy coming out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see him for the next few weeks. And what I've decided is I'm just not going to really acknowledge him because I anticipate him coming up to me and saying something. And I'm just not interested. I'm just not interested. You know, I deal with men all the time. There are some things you can take care of. There are some men that you could speak to intelligently and clear things up with them and work things through. And then there are other men where you, with whom you cannot. And so I know from this energy that it's fine. I don't need to say anything. I don't need to have a relationship with them. I don't really want to be bothered. So that's a choice we have to make sometimes too. And that is very powerful. You just have to be the bigger man in those situations. You can't let other people get the best of you. And contrary to what other people might think, being the bigger man is not fighting. It's just walking away. And uh, I think for a lot of guys, that ego wants to defend itself. And sometimes the only way to do that, especially in a heated situation, is to get physical, which like you mentioned, is just going to end up uh, in the wrong. You're going to end up in the wrong place. Like you can end up in jail. And Wayne, I did want to jump 180 into a different topic here. I wanted to talk about porn and masturbation and its effects on men today. Well, that's a big topic. Um, 
<laughs> well, we'll do a little, you know, we'll do what we can. Um, I don't think, well, masturbation is fine, healthy, good, good for you. Excessive masturbation is not. What would you define as healthy, regular masturbation versus excessive masturbation? There have definitely been studies that uh, suggest that regular masturbation or orgasm keeps you healthy, keeps the prostate healthy. It's good for us. So, I mean, it's like, it's like alcohol and drugs. The question is, is it a problem for you? So a drink a day may be not a problem for you, but if you're an alcoholic and one drink can lead to unlimited drinks and blackouts, then it's a problem. You have to decide for yourself what's a problem. Now, porn, there are times when porn is great, you know, when a couple want to watch it and it gets them turned on and it's fabulous. Like whatever, whatever you do with the consenting adult that works for you, I think is fine. Right, so I have no judgment around that. But what you're suggesting, though, is that the proliferation of porn uh, on the on the web is a convenient place for guys who are having trouble in relationships. It's a convenient place for them to hide out, and it's incredibly seductive, and it's easy, and it becomes an addiction. So if it's keeping you from having a vital sex life with your partner. If it's keeping you from going out and meeting people, it's a problem. But you have to decide if it's a problem. Now, the men in your life can look at you and say, dude, it's obviously a problem. You're masturbating three times a day and you're staying at home watching video games. you got a problem. Okay, So it's pretty easy for the guys in a circle who care and know about each other to see when there's a problem. And what we say is that if you're in a circle of men and everyone is saying one thing, and you're saying something else, you're wrong, <laughs> right? And so that, that is about being supportable and letting the wisdom in. Now, it's difficult for guys to do that. They get defensive, right? But that's what you learn when you're in a circle like that, that if everyone's telling you something, there's something there for you. So, you know, it used to be that we had Playboy. When I was younger, you know, you'd steal your dad's Playboy or whatever and jerk off and it's like, great, and get to know breasts. And I mean, it, you know, it's awesome. Those images are awesome. We love it. You know, straight men, whatever, you love women. Those images are exciting. The problem nowadays is that uh, marketing and advertising experts are using those images constantly and they are really affecting us really, really affecting us. And now the images on porn, what porn has become, so, you know, it's so harmful to the people involved. I mean, the girls who are going to it, the runaways, you, you, you know, in these movies, you can see, you can see the innocence being lost in some of these movies that are all over the web. So it's terrible, it's really terrible what's happened. And the images that get locked in your memory really affect what women are and as if all women should love you coming all over them that's not that doesn't exist it's not all women there are some girls that might like to do that but the images that we've seen in porn are not necessarily part of healthy sexual relations could be there are some people who are into all sorts of things and it's fine but it really does keep young guys and older guys from having a healthy perspective of what a relationship should look like and what they should expect sexually from a woman. Yeah, Wayne, I recently read a study where a boy sees his first porno at age eight years old. I mean, just think about the future. Think about how it's going to affect that guy's life, his sexual life, as he grows up. Yes. Well, listen, having we have to be responsible for ourselves as men. Porn is one issue. Substance is another issue. Dealing with our anger is another issue. I mean, all these things you have the ability for. Yes, it's easy to go to porn, but if it's not healthy for you, don't do it. And if you're having trouble not doing it, then you have to ask for help. It takes a long time for those images to get out of your head. It takes a, I mean, um, they don't, it's, it's easy to click empty cash on your computer it's much more difficult to empty the cash in your own mind.
And that's very powerful. I mean, if you're going to be looking at porn and masturbating every day, it's going to have a huge effect on your life. It's going to change the way you view women. It's going to really dramatically affect your sex life and, and not for the better. You're looking at women. You're, you're not you're not actually having these experiences with women. You're experiencing them through a laptop, a computer. It's not the same. It's not going to have a, a positive effect on your life. And Wayne, the question that everybody wants me to ask you, what does it mean to be a man in your definition? So my book, Hold On To Your Nuts, Nuts is an acronym for non-negotiable, unalterable terms. Non-negotiable, unalterable terms. Now, these are the things that a man is committed to that define a man. And these things, if compromised, will make a man uh, resentful, angry, pissed off, and he takes it out on everybody around him. So in my definition, a man, a mature, healthy man, is someone who knows what his nuts are and can honor them in his life and in all of his relationships. And they're different for all men. So I don't have a notion of what that man looks like. There's room for all kinds of men. But as I have found out, and certainly this was my path, I had no idea what I was committed to. I had no idea what it meant for me to be a man. So, But when I found out and I got clear and I made commitments where the commitments had not existed, and I started honoring them and becoming that man and showing up that way in my life, it became easier and easier for me to comfortably be that man in all situations. And as I mentioned before, obviously, I'm still tested like everybody else, but I'm not worried anymore. I mean, I, I am the man I want to be most of the time. And when I feel like I'm going down the wrong path, the man that I want to be gets on the phone and talks to a guy I trust. So it's these non-negotiable, unalterable terms or nuts is what the man creates for himself. And then being able to honor those is what creates that man, that honor, that that passion for his nuts. <laughs> I, I know that sounds funny, but it's it's holding on to your values and living them. Just to let everybody listening in, uh, the book is available in print, in e-formats and audio uh, on Audible. And all those links are on uh, my website, bettermancoaching.com. Okay, thanks, Wynn. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes for all the listeners. And one last question before we jump into the knowledge round is, how can men connect with their masculine side? How can men be more masculine? Yeah, they don't even realize it, right? They're not seeing it. And I think your and younger, I think they grew up in high school, like being more in groups, right? It's it, it's all we're all we're all the same. Like boys and girls are the same. We're, you know, a girl could be my best buddy, and and there's not that honoring of well, that's cool to be close and to be friends, but there's a real difference between men and women, and we're not taught that. You know, life skills courses in high school, those that have them don't teach that. They don't teach the differences between men and women. It's just not socially acceptable. School districts won't allow it. You know, it's very charged, but there's a big difference. And so the best thing men and young guys can do is uh, if you don't have friends in your life, you don't have buddies, go find them. Um, When you have a problem, don't be ashamed to share it with a friend because more often than not, that guy will really be grateful that you brought the issue to him because now it gives him the permission to come to you when he has something. You know, you, you may not each have the answer for each other, but just sharing it oftentimes, just giving air to this problem you're having can make the problems easier, um, can make them go away, at least um, more manageable. And together you can go find the answer. It might be by uh, bringing in the help of another guy. So reaching out, um, talking to your dad, uh, letting your dad know, or the guy who played your dad growing up, how much you appreciate him, how much you love him, and you know, making it a priority to clean up those male relationships in your life. Because I'm telling you, these things will dog you till the day you die. So if you don't have a good relationship with your father, that is the first place to start. And you may not be able to do this, on, you probably won't be able to do this on your own. But I'll tell you that with the retreat that we do, relationship with father is one of the most important things that we deal with. It's crucial in terms of how we become, uh, how the men that we become has so much to do with our relationship with our own father. 
Okay, so having strong relationship with father is very important. And also having relationships with your friends, having having peers around you that can help you and guide you is something very powerful in building masculinity. And now, Wayne, we've just entered my favorite part of the show. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guest will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives. Starting in three, two, one. Showtime. How would you explain becoming a man to an 18-year-old boy? Well, even if you're 18, it's never too early to be the man you want to be. And a lot of 18-year-olds are pissed at their parents, and they take it out on their parents, but all they're really hurting is themselves. And so I have this conversation with 12-year-olds even. So an 18-year-old is like, you're about to go away. You're about to graduate from high school. You're about Perhaps you're going to go away to school. There are things that you better take a look at now because when you get to college, you are going to get fucked up if you're unconscious. What was personally holding you back from becoming the man you wanted to become? Um, My mother was very angry. She hated men. And I was on the receiving end of a lot of negative energy. So I grew up uh, thumbing my nose at authority, uh, not taking any input from any man and just doing it myself. And so the biggest challenge I had was to learn the value of men in my life and to connect and become the man that I needed to become. I like it. What's the best advice you've ever received from a mentor? Sometimes you just need to pick up your woman, throw her on the bed, go down on her, give her a kiss and tell her you'll see her tonight. (laughs) I've uh, done quite a few interviews, and I've never gotten anything similar to that. Well, you never you, – you, listen, we have a saying in, in our circle of men. You never can know, and you really never know. You never know what life has to offer you. You never know what wisdom looks like. You never know – the lessons that you have to learn. And so the best thing to do is to have that support network to build, develop, cherish, honor those relationships with other men because things are going to happen that I'm telling you, you you can never anticipate. And you are going to be very grateful that you've taken the time to invest in these masculine relationships. I like it. Now, what is your favorite book and why? Listen, the latest, the, the last book I read that rocked my world is called uh, Sex at Dawn. And it absolutely turns on its head our notion of human sexuality. And my sense is that that book is going to impact my work in a way that's going to be really transformative. And right now I'm in the process of just understanding all that material and uh, trying to figure out how I can use it to help men. I like that. I'll have to check that book out. Wayne, what's one action one person can take to getting them closer to becoming the man they want to become? Tell the truth to a man in your life. Tell the truth. Stop lying to yourself. Stop holding back. Stop trying to look good. Tell the truth. Free yourself. It's really true. The truth will set you free. And I'm telling you, um, it it is a reality. And uh, you ought to do it at every opportunity. Tell the truth. I like that. Wayne, I have a scenario for you. Imagine you had just graduated college. You're 22 years old. What would you do? I would not be in a long-term committed relationship. I would um, teach uh, English as a second language a few different countries. Um, I would do a lot of reading. I would connect with men. I would look for mentors. I would not be so concerned about my career because I would know going back that I'm going to be changing it a few times. And at 22, I have no idea who I am or what I want to do. So I would go out in the world and uh, seek knowledge, have a good time, work my way around the world. And when I was ready, I would come back and after many short-term relationships and learning about what women are all about, then later I would know that it's time to find someone to start a family with if that's what I still wanted. And I have to tell you, having kids was the best thing I ever did. And I couldn't agree more, Wayne. There's so many guys out there in their early 20s. They just graduate. They, they find a the girl and you know they're in love and it's good. 
and it lasts for a while. And then they marry the girl to try and, you know, save the relationship and make it last longer and maybe have kids to make the, maybe that's going to make the relationship better and never really exploring who they are I mean, never traveling, never really doing the things that they wanted to do, but really just settling for this one girl. And it's really so important to date and, and meet many people so that you know what you want, you know what you're looking for. And more importantly, you know what you don't want. And it's, it's really powerful to spend your early 20s in a time of self-discovery and explore and travel and really just become the person that you want to become so that you're going to attract the person that you really want. I mean, I know I just went on a little rant there, but moving on. Wayne, if you had to write your obituary today, what would it say? He was really committed to helping men, and he hopes he made a difference. Have fun. Listen, life is short. If I could talk to my 30-year-old self, I would tell him, relax, dude, relax. The money that you're making is fine. It's not about the money. Don't get distracted with the money. You need to find joy. You need to have joy. You need to learn to be in the moment. And whatever help you need, counseling, men's groups, retreats, readings, meditation, yoga, whatever you need to do, find joy, surround yourself with people who really are enjoying themselves. And that is the greatest gift you can have. Wow, I'm being personally moved here. Wayne, that is such powerful, powerful knowledge there. <laughs> Let me, and, and just a little side note, go to Burning Man at least once. Ah, I got invited. <laughs> I missed it. Go to Burning Man because it's an amazing situ- It's an amazing experience, and uh, and um, if you're gonna use drugs, just be really responsible. Be really responsible. Wayne, I'll definitely have to check out Burning Man. And as we're coming to a close, I want to ask: Do you have any parting piece of guidance for the audience? Man, have I not shared enough wisdom <laughs> with you today? You need more. Yes. I want everything. I want it all. (laughs) My parting piece of wisdom. There's, you know, so I'm just going to riff a little bit on my opening quote from Billy Joel, who said, don't take any shit from anyone. There's great power in getting to a place where you no longer give a shit what anyone thinks about you. Now, that doesn't mean not giving a shit about things, but about caring what other people think about you, your parents, co-workers, friends, anyone. There's great power in not caring because the minute you stop caring, you're free to simply be the man you want to be. And that is the goal. I love that. Not caring about what other people think about you has allowed me personally to have the freedom to do the things that I truly want to do. And just don't care. All the listeners, don't care. Do what you want to do because you want to do it, and that's what's going to make you happy. And Wayne, what's exciting you today? What are you currently working on? What's your vision for the future? And go ahead and leave yourself a plug so the audience can connect with you. I'm probably going to start working on another book, but that's such a chore. I'm not terribly excited about that at the moment. Um, So anyway, I coach men individually, couples. I work with boys, so men of all ages. I run several men's groups a week in uh, Southern California, plus I have phone groups for men who are located all over the world. So I do a lot of coaching. I do coaching in office, and I do coaching via phone and Skype. So all of that is uh, detailed at bettermencoaching.com. You can also get uh, a copy of my book, Hold On to Your Nuts, The Relationship Manual for Men. Plus there are several articles and videos linked to that site that will give uh, guys a real good understanding of where I'm coming from and how we go about doing this work. All right, everybody, go ahead and check out bettermancoaching.com and connect with Wayne Levine. He's just given us so much valuable, valuable knowledge that I personally need a break to sit back and think about everything that he shared with us today. So Wayne, thank you so much for being on this show. And for all the listeners out there, before you head out, check out knowledgeformen.com. That's knowledge, F-O-R, men.com. I've provided and written so much valuable, valuable content that I really want you guys to take a look there. I also got some free tools there. You can check out the Knowledge for Men Toolkit, which gives you advice on dating, relationships, personal growth, health, wealth, how to obtain financial freedom, how to get your passion. And guess what? All of that's free. A $99 value, yours free knowledgeformen.com and check out free tools or knowledgeformen.com slash free tools 
and get on the free stuff. You guys have a great day. Wayne, thank you so much for being on the show. And that's going to wrap up episode four. Have a great day. Crush life. Thank you for listening to the Knowledge for Men podcast show. Now go crush the day, live better, take action, and get the life you've always dreamed of.